Hello there. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world you are watching me from. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Bet Series. Biologists explain this. And in this edition, we are continuing our discussion on genetic basis of life, the part two. I hope you enjoyed the first part and you were very informed when we discussed DNA, how DNA is coiled up with stone proteins to form um, um, to form nucleosomes and then compacted eventually to form chromosome. We talked about the essence of having to fold chromo uh, DNA into chromosomes and the fact that the DNA takes different form in a non-dividing cell and a cell that is about to divide. We talked about those things. So if you are watching this particular edition and you have not watched the first part, please download or watch from our YouTube channel. And so we are looking at the story behind the DNA, DNA and the gene on DNA. There's so much about DNA that we know, but who are the contributors? Of course, the major contributors, because the journey of any scientific um, discovery it takes a long time. It involves a lot of people. So usually we talk about the prominent individuals, and, but every scientific discovery or breakthrough will have depended on so many individuals who, who played their part or their roles. This person will start it, get stuck, and then can't proceed. Another person will discover the work and then have an instinct or a hunch or an idea and build on what the previous person had done. And so that's what we want to look at. Of course, the any student of um, cell and the molecular biology will find this particular um, edition very informative. So come along with us and let's go on this journey together. Now let's look at what we want to cover in this particular video. Now in this particular edition, we want to consider the journey, that is the timeline concerning how DNA came about being regarded now as the genetic molecule and everything that has to do with DNA. So Friedrich Mecher, the Fibus Levin, and then with Chagav, Rosalind Franklin that unfortunately lost out of the award, uh, the Nobel Prize Award in that year, 1962, for physiology and medicine. And then Wilkins who was a contemporary colleague of Franklin's and then was Saint and Creek that are reputed to be the ones that figured out the structure of DNA, having built on the works of other people. And then, of course, what are nucleotides and genes and the genetic code of organisms. So these are the things we want to cover in this particular edition of BET series. Still on the journey, the timeline. Now, you can imagine that the journey began right from the 19th century. In 1860, this Swiss chemist, Friedrich Mecher, was the first that identified the existence of a molecule called DNA. Of course, you can Google to find, to obtain the details of this. Otherwise, we don't want to make him, this video too bulky. Okay, then Levin and Awin Chagav, their researches revealed that DNA consists of units called nucleotides. Okay, now DNA is a nucleic acid. That's a polymer. We did say that in the first part of this lesson on um, or this series on genetic basis of life and so they, 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 they talked about the primary chemical components and the ways they are joined together to form nucleic acids that's their role and of course Franklin was a biophysicist okay um, any student that is struggling with um, what he or she wants to study in the university can google this and find out what it means to be a biophysicist now the world is transiting and evolving they are Courses now that you refer to as interdisciplinary. We are courses um, are interlinked, so it's not about I'm a physicist, I'm a chemist anymore. You can be, a, you can even study by chemical engineering, and things are just happening today in today's world of learning and study. And so, um, Franklin was a biophysicist, and then from from a study on X-ray crystallography, she she discovered the structure of DNA. Of course. A, a discovery showed that there, there were two strands, but she couldn't explain it. So in so in what was termed 
uh, photograph 51, Franklin just showed that there was an existence of a double-stranded structure, but she did not know exactly what to do with it in terms of explaining the biological basis of what she discovered. And so, let's turn our attention now to Watson and Creek. Of course, Watson and Creek did no experiments of their own. Let me emphasize this. Okay, like I said in the previous slides, science is, is evolving, it's a progression. So everybody who, is, who has a hunch, who has an instinct, every intellectual or somebody who loves researches will just discover the work of somebody else and have an idea and say, wait a minute, I can do more than this, I can build on this person's work. So, I mean, there were many information at, at, um, at the availability of um, Watson and Creek. They had access to other people's work and particularly then Franklin had a colleague in the same university where she was doing her work. That, that colleague of ours is named Maurice Wilkins. Now Wilkins worked closely with Watson and Creek and therefore showed this scientist what Franklin discovered. And so what they did was they spent hours and hours in their laboratory in Cambridge University and at different places when they were eating at pubs and things like that. They were just ruminating because they had knowledge of bond formation and things like that. And then looking at the X-ray crystallography photograph of Franklin, they had a discovery, okay? After, after long spell of thoughts and ideas and discussion and ruminating, they arrived at this issue that DNA was a helical structure. And so they, they were able to link so um, they were able to link the structure, the, the, the issue of what came from extra crystallography um, work of Franklin. They put the pieces together and they were able to figure out, okay, so they worked out the structure of DNA as a double helical structure. So what we know now is that um, DNA and RNA are nucleic acids. Okay, both of them are needed as genetic molecules, but they play different roles, as you are going to see in subsequent lessons. And so they are made up of chains, log chains of nucleotides. So nucleotides can be considered or said to be the monomers that are used to build nucleic acids, not called DNA and RNA. And a nucleotide consists of three basic components. So you've got the sugar, okay? The sugar is a five carbon sugar, a pentose sugar, as you can call it. One is called ribose, which is a sugar in RNA. You have, you have to understand this and remember this for the sake of examination. And then the other sugar is deoxyribose sugar, which is the sugar found in the chain of DNA. Of course, do you have a phosphate attached to the sugar and then you've got a third component which is a nitrogen containing base now these are these bases are nitrogenous they are organic bases and you have to differentiate them from the inorganic bases like your caustic soda sodium hydroxide caustic potash koh and then all the other hydroxides that you have learned about these bases are organic bases so please note that don't confuse them with any OH or KOH or any other base that you have come across. These are organic nitrogenous bases. And so these bases are, of course, in DNA, since our focus on DNA, uh, the, the bases are hydronine, you've got cytosine, you've got guanine, and then you've got thymine. Of course, there's a fifth base, which is found only in RNA. And so we're going to see as we still go on with this study that um, RNA consists of uracil instead of thymine. So in essence, there are five bases, but each nucleic acid, that is DNA or RNA, each one of them consists of only four out of these five. And so the bases in DNA are ACGT, while the bases in RNA are ACGU. Please note these facts. And still on Watson and Crick's work, now they worked out the DNA, okay, so let's look at what they worked out. They worked out the fact that um, DNA consists of a sugar phosphate backbone. That is the strand of DNA. So you can see DNA, picture it in your mind's eye like a ladder. Okay. And then they are connected by bases. So you can see the base like the rungs of the ladder. 
So the pillars of the ladder are the sugar phosphate molecules that form they, they form the, the chain, okay? And then you've got the rocks of the ladder which are represented by the bases that are bonded together. So an adenine is always bonded to a thymine, that's the AT bonding. And then a cytosine is always bonded to a guanine, that is the CG bond. And then these two strands are actually anti-parallel, okay? In, because they face different um, positions, what you call the three prime, five prime direction and the five prime, three prime direction respectively. Now these three prime, five prime, they talk about the carbon atoms on the sugar. Remember, if you look, we are going to look at the structure of this components of nucleotides soon on okay but now the sugar is organic the bases two are organic so they both contain carbon atoms so for the sake of clarity when you are mentioning a particular carbon whose carbon are you having to mention is the carbon atom on the nitrogenous base or the sugar on the five carbon i'm sorry is it the carbon on the sugar which is the pentose or a carbon atom on then nitrogenous base so to distinguish between these carbons that's why prime is added to the carbon atoms on the sugar so since it's a pentose you got one prime two prime three prime four prime five prime carbons respectively so this prime addition distinguishes the carbons on the pentose sugar from the carbon atoms on the nitrogenous basis, please. So when you, so if you are wondering what is this three prime five prime thing, so if you look at the the, the chain of a, a nucleic acid, you are going to find that um, the five prime three prime talks about the orientation and they are anti-parallel. So one strand or chain is in three prime five prime orientation, while the other one is the five prime three prime orientation. And so what Watson and Crick and of course Wilkins did using the work of Franklin was to work out the details okay and then this and then the nobel prize for medicine and physiology or, or physiology in 1962 and so i mean that's that's not too far from when franklin died franklin died in 1958 that is four years early before the award was given she died at a very early stage maybe the activity she was exposed to in the course of her researches because she died of ovarian cancer unfortunately of course cancer one of the causes of cancer is a high level of exposure to radioactive toxic radioactive um, radiation so it's possible that it's these exposures that caused the cancer that killed franklin at the age of 37 and nobel prize is unfortunately not awarded posthumously so when somebody has died you can't award Nobel Prize to that person posthumously. Another fact you will need to know, dear listener, about Nobel Prize is that it's only awarded to not more than three people at once. And so it's a matter of who, des who deserves it. So even if Franklin was alive at the, at the time the award was being given, it would have been a battle to decide which of the four of them must be dropped Watson, Creek, Wilkins, and Franklin. So I, I, I demise probably made it easier for these three. So a scientist to be given the Nobel Prize in 1962 for medicine or physiology. And let's look at the features of what Watson and Crick model of DNA came to be. And so DNA consists of two polynucleotide strains, that is strands or chains as you can call them. Then you've got each strand is a chain of several nucleotides. Of course, the chain can be long or, or short depending on the kind of organism and then this this the, 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 the sugar phosphates are bonded covalently the bond is referred to as a phosphodiester bond that links the phosphate to the sugar and of course you've got the basis sticking out at about 90 degrees okay angle 90 that is perpendicular to the phosphodiester chain okay and then or the phosphate sugar chain rather and then you've got a nucleotide okay so the, the bases stick out at 90 degrees from the sugar phosphate backbone and of course from their from their com consideration of their conclusion you got the bases forming a pairing okay so the pairing is such that an 80 okay bonding exists is a, a you break actually you can have a t or t a it doesn't matter it's just like saying a plus b or b plus a is an algebraic a discussion or a consideration 
and so the bases stick out and the bases are paired like that and the pairs are bonded by hydrogen bond that's very important remember hydrogen bonds are weak okay so if you're wondering why is um, DNA even a spiral why is it helical one of the um, reasons is that um, let's say a major reason is that the hydrogen bonds are weak so when DNA has been formed it is twisted into a helix the helix tends to help to hide in quotes the weak hydrogen bonds otherwise there will be more frequent mutation that may be lethal and dangerous to organisms because the mutations are frequent but at least they are mild not all mutations are lethal meaning have the capacity to cause death and so the hydrogen bonds that hold the base pairs together are weak but DNA after having been formed is twisted into a helix and this sort of helps to keep or maintain the, the structure of DNA I mean there's a level of stability so to say and so the base pairing is established so those are the key features of what the, the, the model of DNA figured out by what and remember they built on the works of others but they had the, the, the breakthrough in being able to describe the, the, the structure of DNA and apart from that this model of DNA made it easy to link the DNA to protein synthesis and replication that precedes cell division and so this diagram this, this slide is showing the structure of a typical nucleotide okay it's showing you how the three components that is the phosphates the sugar and the bases how they are joined together to form what is known as nucleotide which are which is a monomer or let's say nucleotides are monomers or building blocks with which nucleic acids are formed so still on nucleotides what are nucleotides made up of just emphasis because we have been talking about these from previous slides so not to waste time on this and so on nucleotides again we saying that um, the sugar phosphates they tend to be the same in all organisms please note that the sugar phosphate is fixed so the strands or the chains of every dna molecule the strand is fixed the sugar is fixed there, there's only one type of deoxyribose sugar and then the phosphate is only of one type so the difference between one dna and another dna is the issue of the bases the the base pairs that you have along the length of the dna in other words is what you call the base sequence okay because the sequences will differ there you have only four bases but there's an enormous way by which they can be uh, 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 arranged on the particular length of the DNA structure. And so that is what you have as a uniqueness of the DNA structure because what makes a DNA different from another one is simply the sequence of arrangement. So the DNA of a goat, the DNA of a dog, the DNA of a plant or microorganism or human being, all DNAs have the same sugar phosphate backbone. But we all differ by by the in respect to our base pairing and the sequence of those bases so no dna is more dna than any other dna or no dna is finer or more beautiful than any other dna all organisms differ simply in the base sequence along the length of the dna that's as simple as it is so this is just talking about other um, nucleotides and what their structures look like so study them and then compare them so they can know why the bonds that you have can be two or three depending on who is pairing with who and so this is another diagram again still showing the numbering so this is showing the numbering of the carbon atoms on the sugars of the nucleotides for the sake of emphasis let's look at the base pairing in details now if you look at the gc pairing there are three hydrogen bonds and the at pairing there are two hydrogen bonds this is a very important information for the sake of examination and understanding the stability of dna as a molecule
and so this is just a, a, another way of presenting the base pairing so if the other slide looks too bulky these particular slides are much simpler in understanding the base pairing and the number of bonds in between the pairs so you can see the halogen bonds that in, in, in represented in blue coloration there so two halogen bonds between AT pairing or even if it is AU also that is still two halogen bonds and then what you have is that you've got three halogen bonds between cytosine and guanine so let's look at the role of Erwin Chagav that we said earlier on because without what Erwin Chagav discovered it might have been difficult for then Watson and Crick to piece up what they discovered and work that eventually. Now, from the work of Chagav, he discovered that by, by, by analyzing the DNAs of different organisms, he discovered that the, the percentage of purines and pyrimidines in the different organisms he sampled, the, the, the percentage was always consistent, meaning you have, a, you have about 50% purine and about 50% of pyrimidine in every sample of double-stranded DNA. And so it showed that the, the, the AT and the CG ratio was consistent in every organism. So if you pick all human beings, the AT CG ratio is consistent in all human beings. So it may differ from organism to organism, but in the same type of organism, or let's say within the same species, this ratio is constant. And so the total amount of purines, which are A plus G, and then the total amount of pyrimidines, that is C plus T, okay, sum total, is equal in all organisms. So this can come in an OBJ question for you. Remember this, if you add the AG together, that gives you the percentage of purines in that sample of DNA for that organism. And if you did the same by adding C and T, you have an idea So what it means is that if you know the, the amount or the percentage of one base, definitely you will be able to figure out the, 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 the other three bases. It's a very simple thing. If percentage is 100%, for example, if I gave you a question that if the percentage of adenine in a sample of DNA was 25%, find out or determine the percentages of the other bases. So please try that. For, for, as a teaser and, and let me know and so let's go to genes now as we are trying to round off this this particular lesson genes are very crucial okay maybe you have been told that genes are this these are that but genes are what are expressed on dna okay genes are segments of dna meaning a gene has a location and has a structure now, let me say that again a gene can be described. You can look for a gene on a chromosome. Remember, chromosomes are made up of DNA strands wound around histone proteins. Okay, so the genes are segments of DNA and they are the basic units of heredity in all organisms. And they are made up of nucleotide bases, nucleotide bases on the DNA. And so where a gene is located on the DNA is called its loci. Okay you can find a locus of a gene okay so where a gene is located is its locus on the chromosome okay and then the genes contain information so this is linking the gene structure to its role okay a gene has the information so what to, the arrangement of the bases that make up a gene will specify the kind of protein that that particular gene specifies and so the information for protein synthesis is encoded in genes. And then when this information is translated or interpreted in code to mean a particular protein, these proteins now be, they control the expression of a particular physical characteristic or trait of an organism. So in case you look at yourself, for example, everything about you is about your genes. So whether you like what you see or not, every feature of the part of your body your head your nose your ear lobes your height your complexion and other features that you might have noticed about you they are encoded in the basis of your genes 
And so genes code for proteins and proteins control all the features of the body. So all of us are unique. So don't envy anybody because you are unique based on your DNA genetic code. And so there's this issue of plasma genes, which are the genes stored in the chromosomes of the nucleus. In part one of this study on the genetic basis of life, we talked about the fact that you can find DNA not only in the nucleus, but also in mitochondria and in the chloroplast. And so the genetic code of an organism is simply the basis and the way they are arranged. So the nucleotide basis and the sequence of those bases make up what you call an organism's genetic code. So an example of a typical genetic code is what you see on the screen there at the bottom, ACCGGT. That sequence can mean the shape of somebody's head, the height of somebody. So there's a code for every characteristic that we all express. And still on genes, still on genes, okay, genes contain information, we've said earlier on, for particular functions of a cell. And then the gene is the fundamental unit of inheritance. And ultimately, genes determine the phenotype. So in our video lesson on Mendelian principles, we'll be discussing phenotypes. Phenotype is not physical. Phenotype is talking about the observable traits that you can observe um, microscopically or by just looking at that person physically, that thing you are looking at that describes or specifies or identifies that individual is its, its or her phenotype. And so every individual's phenotype is all about the genes. So genes specify phenotype. And so that is why mutations are very important or deadly or significant because when you alter the base sequence of a gene, you are going to get a different phenotype which may be pleasant. Look at an albino, for example. So in, in, in subsequent videos, we'll be discussing genetic disorder. So sickle cell anemia, spina bifida, orthotis chorea, and then things like um, um, Down syndrome and all kinds of disorders that are of genetic basis. They are all caused by mutation. So albinism and the rest. So sickle cell, you can imagine how devastating these disorders are all because of an alteration to the sequence of bases that make up a gene. So the DNA of, an, of a particular human being is, is made up of hundreds of thousands of genes. Of course, this is an estimated figure. Of course, there, there, there are scientific bodies like the Human Genome Project, HGP, trying to figure out what is the exact amount of genes in the nucleus of an organism particularly human being because that's human genome project but it's a very enormous task very daunting task you can agree when you have microscopic dna and you're trying to figure out genes if you can't even see dna with your naked eyes you can imagine how many genes are packed along the length of a particular dna and so the the genes specify so and genes are not expressed equally in all the cells different genes are active in different parts of the body so you are seeing the example that the genes for hemoglobin protein, actually, the genes are not active in brain cells. I want you to Google this particular information and get back to me and explain, because I deliberately decided not to explain it, so because it's part of learning. And then, so, the, 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 as we're running off the issue of genes, the gene, from the molecular point of view, is simply the sequence of nucleotides on a DNA and that particular sequence has a functional role, okay? And then there are two types of molecular genes. Not all genes code for proteins. That's very important for you as a student or as a listener because it's usually assumed that all the bases on DNA code for proteins. No, there are non-coding genes. Genes do more than code for proteins. In fact, it's been estimated that only about 3% of the genes on a DNA actually code for proteins. The rest don't code for anything. You can call them nonsense genes or something, or they code for something else. So genes are not only about proteins. Okay, so remember they are non-coding genes because not only proteins are needed by an organism. 
some genes code for some other traits of the organism and not just proteins and so there's something in biochemistry called the central dogma this dogma is about the dna information is copied to form a messenger rna that's what you call mrna and the mrna is eventually translated or interpreted to mean the polypeptide chain of a particular protein we'll talk, we'll talk about this in the subsequent videos on protein synthesis but note that the central dogma is about using the dna information to eventually form proteins but not all the genes on the dna are used for protein synthesis the region of the dna that codes for a protein is called exon so exons are dna regions that code for specific proteins so you can imagine that the remaining part of the dna are not called exons you call them introns so introns of a dna are non-coding sections of the dna so genes can be short or long okay only the exons are used for protein synthesis the other regions are called ex the introns like i said in previous slide so you have these non-coding regions and then of course the the introns usually have to be removed that is excised okay you call this mrna modification because usually when you are transcribing dna to form mrna a lot of things can happen so it's just a copying procedure so usually in eukaryotic cells of course this does not occur in prokaryotes so because you have you you will go to learn in subsequent editions of our discussion on best series that in prokaryotes protein synthesis is different in details from what obtains in eukaryotic cells okay so in intro in, in eukaryotic cells there is always the need to modify the mrna that was copied directly from the gene to leave only the what the exon so the intronic regions are usually removed before translating the mrna sequence onto the polypeptide chain of a protein and so the the, the complete genetic information of an organism is called its genome and this can run into thousands hundreds of thousands and this is the one of the reasons or a major reason why mutations are are always going to occur let me put it that way mutations are always going to occur because if you are going to have to deal with uh, almost a million okay almost a million sources of information packed together within a small nucleus by the time you are unwinding dna and having to copy and things like that errors are likely to happen so we are going to treat mutations in later videos so you have transversion you've got deletion what you call the indel all kinds okay there are all kinds of gene mutations and all of these have different effects on the health of the organism ultimately and so there are repair mechanisms in eukaryotic cells mechanisms to remove all these some of them are proofreading during translation during cell cycle all of these are to ensure that the errors are minimal as much as possible and so as we begin the round off let's summarize the features of the model of dna proposed by watson and crick that earned them the nobel prize in 1962 for medicine or physiology dna consists of two polynucleotide strands which are antiparallel and each chain is what we mean at a parallel is 3 prime 5 prime meaning a, three, a third carbon of the sugar is bonded to a fifth carbon of the next one and the other chain the other chain of strand is in the 5 prime 3 prime orientation adjusted basis projects at approximately 90 degrees okay from this chain of course the sugar phosphate backbone is held by a bond called phosphate diester bond remember that it's a phosphate bond bonding to the sugar and then that bond is called the phosphodiester bond and then bases project at right angles i've said that earlier on the bases or the base pairs are held by hydrogen bonds okay and then chagas rule of course old here the rule holds true here that you've got the at and then gc and then the percentage of adenine is always equal to the timing you just like saying you've got 50 
50 um, wives at a party, for example, that's hypothetically um, 50 husbands, so to say. Okay, so hypothetically, you've got A and T bonded together, so they are always equal in every organism, apart from viruses. Because viruses, if you have a retrovirus, the RNAs are always single stranded. You can learn that later. RNA is so when you're comparing RNA and DNA. RNA is whether you are messenger or you are, you are, you are transfer or so there is tRNA, you have mRNA, there is ribosomal RNA. All these three RNAs are all single stranded. So there is no worry about base pairing in RNAs. But base pairing is important in the structure and function of all double stranded DNAs. And so you have to understand the issue of base pairing. Everything about DNA stability and function is premised on this base pairing. So we're going to see that. We're going to see the importance of base pairing when we get to protein synthesis and the replication of DNA during the interface of the cell cycle. And so two hydrogen bonds maintain the base pairing between adenine and guanine, and you've got three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and guanine, respectively. And so, if you've, if you've enjoyed this lesson, please like and share this video with your colleagues and friends and go over them over and over again. Practice past questions that are relevant to the exam you're preparing for. And then we are always saying we want to hear from you. Okay? We want to hear your questions, your comments, your observations. If you have topics that you want us to prepare videos on, we are very ready to help. Anything that will help your success. We are eager and willing and ready and available to help in this regard. So get in touch with me on, your, on WhatsApp, email, Instagram, YouTube. And please, you can watch so many other videos on our YouTube channel. We've got so very many interesting biology videos that can help you to understand some topics while preparing for that examination. And so uh, we are always eager to help. Get in touch. Send your questions and observations. And please like, share, and comment, and let these videos go viral so that more people can learn and pass their exams with ease, with minimum stress. And so thank you for watching. Thank you for staying tuned. See you in the next lesson. Bye.